Passover establishes the ninth covenant. And the ninth covenant remains void to all who have not come into oneness with our Father. So, if you haven't accepted Jesus and the blood of Jesus or Yeshua, you are voiding. It doesn't matter what else you claim in the Bible. You void the ninth covenant. You cannot claim it as part of who you are and what you have available to you. And if you're not able to come into oneness with our Father and Yeshua and the Holy Spirit, and even, um, shall we say, a oneness with those that keep or are keeping the Passover celebration, what is it that you have released? You become a tear. See, if you can't enter oneness, the definition of that is you become a tear, a false, you know, he says, the, a false wheat. And uh, who planted all these tares here? They were, they were in the right garden, but the, they wouldn't produce the red seed. And it is in observing Passover that our Father has been given through us the authority to adopt us as sons, to favor us, to bless us, and bless us fully, to grant us all the graces or empowerments to anoint us and to give us eternal life. As we have come to know and become that oneness with Yeshua. So, If you want eternal life, it's not just a matter that you believe that Yeshua is God, but that you can become one with Him. That you're willing to be changed to become one like Yeshua. Therefore, it is Yeshua's blood that we accept as the covenant offering and the seal to our oneness. And if you look at those saints that overcame, what did they overcome by? Their testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. You notice it wasn't by their complaining and bitching and things like that. And a lot of the Whining word, and sibling weren't included either. A lot of the word of their testimony was based on the power of the blood also. Mm -hmm. Our commitment in the ninth covenant, our commitments there in the ninth covenant are, one, we accept that we have been bought back or redeemed out of the kingdom of darkness. Do you know that? Say, oh yeah, I, I'm out of the kingdom of darkness. But that means what? That you don't go seeking out the, the things of darkness anymore. You don't go chasing the things that make you impure, unclean, unrighteous. And yet, if you listen to a lot of the teachers, they say, oh, well, it's okay to involve a little bit of paganism here and then do this, do that. Yeah. And no, it isn't. If it's not told for you to do it in the Word of God, don't do it. 
So, if we're going to be accepted, that we're bought back, that we've been, our life has been redeemed, then we are to be pure and act pure, like Yeshua was pure. Two is, we accept Yeshua as our brother and God. Now this is some things that really, people that are stuck in religiosity refuse to do. People that live by their traditionalisms uh, don't want to acknowledge that, Yeshu that we are brothers of Yeshua, and that He is also our God. Not our Lord, our God. Our God. Three, we accept that we need to change to be more like Yeshua in our speaking, our thinking, our giving, and all our attitudes towards others is if we consider ourselves better than somebody else, what will happen? We become a respecter of persons. Is, is our father a respecter of persons? No. No. But once we decide we're going, we're better than somebody else, there's a demonic force that comes into you because you're asking to be possessed. So what happens is that whenever you look at that other person and, and say, well, they don't meet my standard, you are now opening the door for attack to everything that has ever attacked that person. You're going to walk that mile in their shoes, but it'll probably be 50 miles before you get freedom. Classifying yourself as better than somebody else has very harsh repercussions. Really, really harsh. We... You know, when we set ourselves above What's called, what is button is Satan pushing to get us to think that we're above someone? Pride. Pride, yes, and? Superiority. Mm, yeah, there could be a superiority, but there's something. Judgmentalism. Self-righteousness. In yourself, what does God classify self righteous as? Dirty rags. Dirty rags. Menstrual rags. Menstrual rags, yeah. Uh -huh. Get that self righteousness out of there. They're <laughs> <laughs> getting attacked with dirty rags. That's what they're getting attacked with? Yeah, and that's often why it shows up as um, uh, when self righteousness has brought something in, it's brought it in. And it will often uh, appear like uh, a dirty towel. Oh, so that's the origin of these dirty towels. It's one of the origins of these right. dirty towels, yes. <clears throat> but self-righteousness is a, a real problem. We accept that we need to change to be more like Yeshua. And I, it's back into number three in here. When we are accepting that we need that change, and then the Holy Spirit shows us where we need to change and we fight it, what have we done? you're fighting, it's defiance. 
you're saying one thing and you're defying God if he shows you what needs to be done. So we, again, have to bring back that our speaking and our thinking and our giving and that um, has to be under the right attitude because that's what the Ninth Covenant was all about. Yeshua gave his life for your freedom. Nobody could take it. He gave it. He went through everything to give. Our giving must mean something or it means nothing. You know, again with number four, we accept our identity in Yeshua as our Father has had it revealed. Now, some things you look at and you say, well, that can't be right. That's too good to be true. But it isn't. What does a father or mother want for their child? The worst? The best. The best. The best. What are they willing to give them? The best. The best. So if you have 490 identities given to you, what does your father want to give you? The best. The best. The best. Okay. So if you don't accept them, or you're fighting one of them, what are you telling him? This isn't your best. It's not good enough for me. Or it requires I have to grow and stretch in the area I don't want to grow in. What does an anointed one do? Why would you be anointed? To serve. to serve, to be a light, mm -hmm. to be a preserver of the earth. The salt that has flavor. If you hide away in a little dark corner in your room, are you carrying out the anointing that was sent before you? No. Um, if you want to run away to a little island where there'll be uh, servants all over the place for you and you never have to do anything, are you carrying out your anointing? No. You're mocking God. You're mocking the anointing that was given unto you. And that's not profitable, shall we say. Six, we accept that we are called to love one another. That's what the ninth covenant's about. God's love for you, and it's of his calling you to love one another. Um, you can't love somebody that you're gossiping about or putting down or griping about or that's not love. When you don't respect that they have needs and times, another person has needs and times to be with God and pray and all this other, that's not love. That's self-righteous. That's coming to the forefront that I'm better than you and you are going to be my slave. You can read about that in violations and intimidation and that. We got teachings that explain that up pretty good. We accept that we are in the, this covenant of love so that we can come to know our Father love. See, if you can't love one another, you will not love God. And you won't be able to put yourself together with Him. 
you will not see him as fa the father of all love. He'll become harsh or uh, making, uh, you'll consider him as making uh, unmerciful moves towards you and things like that, but it's you making the unmerciful moves towards him. You don't sow mercy, you don't get it. You don't sow forgiveness, you can't receive forgiveness. And what about Pastor Joe, like when families, when one, in a way, come against another? They well, don't talk, they don't speak, yeah. they don't communicate. Okay. Is that, that is a, a breach of the family, you know, the, the whole covenants of love. But there are times when, what? Another member of the family is doing is not to influence what we do. We are called to love. Yeah. Okay. And no matter what they do, that's their choice to what they do. We are called to be yeah. ones that uh, show love to everyone. It reminds me of a person that lived lived here that you know, he came as a very hostile person when he first arrived, um, heavily drinking and using drugs and that. And then when we seen that we didn't approve of drugs, he got off drugs, and he was working to get rid of his um, excessive drinking, even smoking before Satan took him out because he he was beginning to see that love was important in life. It wasn't how much pleasure you could get out of using other people. It's love counted. And in tears in his eyes he says, I've never belonged anywhere before, but I feel like I belong. And when he got cards of uh, uh, prayers of get, to get well and all that, that, he says, I realize I belong somewhere. I belong here. God brought me here to learn. And he said, I said, there was tears in sights, and he says, although I don't know all the members of the congregation, I feel a love for them that I can't express. That was very important. It was a breakthrough. And then Satan took him out before he could really make the changes he needed. And he spoke out truth to others. Yes, he did. His journey going through it. Mm -hmm. He was he was not fearful to speak of God. No, no. he wasn't. But he seen the covenant of love in action, and it changed it. It broke the power of the demonic forces. He was willing to say no to them the demons that he would never have said no to before. Well, <coughs> you see, part of being that light to the world is to be that love that sets people free. The eighth part of this covenant is that we are to be peacemakers kingdom ambassadors and the lights to a dark world. But also that salt of salt, you know, that saves them. Preserving salt. Our prayers preserve people alive. And what kind of a peacemaker won't accept the king of peace. What kind of peacemaker won't accept 
that Yeshua is your righteousness and that you are to walk in righteousness. When you're an ambassador, you are an example of kingdom love or the kingdom law, the kingdom conditions of that kingdom or that government that you represent. And each Passover, what we're doing is we're saying, yes, we will grow to learn and carry out and function with that kind of That we will be the, that ambassador. We will be that light for this world. It needs it. It's crying out for it right now. All they have to hold on to is fear. And how much peace do you get out of living in fear? Not Nine, we accept our role as decreers of the word. Um, we're also decreers of what is good and what is evil. We, we, we have that discernment given to us under this covenant. We are bond and yoke breakers. And we're pillars of truth under this covenant. So, if you're there to decree the word, you're also there to be the, a pillar of truth. You don't compromise the word, in other words. If you're a pillar holding up the roof of a, in a building and you decide that you want to take a day off and go out and, and lay around in the sunshine, does the, what happens to the roof? It's weaker. It falls. But we're the builders, not the destroyers. Ten, we accept we are bearers of God's will. And bearers of the good news. We have to see that good news is what the world needs right now. All, they got, all they're used to getting is bad news. But we have an obligation to speak out and teach good news. The Ninth Covenant calls us to receive all the commitments that Yeshua has acknowledged to provide. And you see, we have our part to play, he has his part. He cannot move before we do our part. If we're not willing to do our part, he can't move. So, what we look at is that protection, number one is protection from accusers and liars and uh, murderers, thieves, vandals, uh, religious bigots, governments with unjust laws, and from banks that seek to abuse and corrupt. You, you have a protection from evildoers. And we have to be willing to receive that, accept that that is there for us, and then receive it. And if you receive something, does that mean you speak against it? You condemn others that are committed to it? No. Yeah. 
But that has become, instead of accepting what this provision of protection, it has become the key light source of the Christian world and is rubbing off on believers that no, there is no protection, but there is. The second point in the Ninth Covenant is that we have to accept and receive total forgiveness for all sin. We cannot let Satan convince us that we're still guilty of something that we've been forgiven of. Because yeah. if, if he can do that, he'll turn around, keep making the same mistakes, same sins over and over and over and over and over again. It'll be a one more time issue every day. Plus, if you accept self-condemnation, that's a road to the unpardonable sin. Um, but Passover does not cover the unpardonable sin. So you don't want to go there. Three is the removal of all guilt, shame, doubt, fear, condemnation, pride, hatred, all strongholds, wrong habits, fetish control, deceptions, false hope, lies, pagan traditions, ignorance, and that's a big one. Some people like to stay ignorant because then they say, oh, well, then I'm not responsible for it, for knowing it, and I can keep doing it because I'm not responsible. Don't you become more responsible then? But they want to live in ignorance. Uselessness. False identities. And harmful goals when we turn them into a god instead of turning them over to Yeshua. But the ninth covenant calls for the removal of them, which means we have to turn them over. Each one of those things has to get turned over. Otherwise, it's a, it's a key to our soul that Satan can push. Four is the healing of all diseases, maimings, deformities, deafness, blindness, and brain and mind troubles. Now, you see, one of the things that allows it to stay with us is that we'll say, I have this. Well, you've already claimed it. God can't take it when you, it's yours. He's not a thief. So when we use the I have, we're claiming that we're discounting the Passover covenant that says all these things are to be healed now. Number five is the healing of all age-corrupting conditions. Your youth restored like an eagle. Okay. And part of the Passover aspect of it is that wages of sin is death. What's the wages of life? Life. Yeah. But a full abundance. He says, I came to have you live an abundant, full life. 
If you're missing a leg, is it a full life? No. No? How about if you're missing a function of, of part of your heart? You no. can barely move. Or if you're in a wheelchair. Or, you know, loss of limbs, loss of the function. You see, in the Passover, we have that claim of full restoration of everything that needs healing. Just like Israelites came out with nothing hurting them at all. This condition for of the, this ninth covenant of healing that it has the aspect of it if you are saved by faith you are healed by faith. And you cannot walk in faith unless you're keeping that. If you're discounting that covenant, you're not wa able to walk in faith. Okay. When healing of all age, number five, there's uh, the healing of all age corrupting conditions. When we look at that, it's not only having your age um, like n not having the symptoms of wear out it's having your youth restored you know, how many of you would hate to be able to do the things you did when you were 25 years old people don't know Depends what they are. Yes. Well, <laughs> you know, no aches, no pains, uh, able to stay up and uh, function all the time. Yeah, sure that, yeah. Yeah. <sighs> well, that is one of all the aspects of age corrupting conditions are reversible. Your youth can be restored under the Ninth Covenant. And it wasn't available under the other covenants. But it is under the ninth covenant. Yeah, I would see that. Mm -hmm. But you gotta accept it first. I accept it and I receive it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, number six is the restoring of prosperity, of the blessing for increase, and family wealth. You know, other than for our mouth, there's no reason why we should be in debt. But it takes us actually accepting and receiving this ninth covenant to get out of debt. It's a turnover item. Seven. Restored communications with her father. And that, not only, that doesn't just mean that we can pray to him and tell him what, what's going on, but it means we are willing to listen to him and the Holy Spirit tell us the answers to make us wiser than all our teachers. All the bosses. When you come up with an answer they can't figure out, do you notice that they have a different respect for you? Or you get fired depending yeah. on the boss. But the restored communication with our Father, He will hear our voice and when we ask according to his will, it's yes and amen. Not well, maybe, or could be. It's yes and amen. Number eight. It is the authority to break all curses, incantations, hexes, false prayers, false vows, false charges against you, 
and to break down all gates Satan has set up against the kingdom of God, against you moving in the kingdom of God. Now, a gate is an authority. And it's also a barrier. So if you can break down a gate, you can walk through and claim what's behind the gate. Okay. But that comes in the Ninth Covenant. Okay. Nine is the authority to raise the dead. To reap claim squandered time and stolen time. That's part of that covenant. To the ability to reclaim what was stolen by Satan out of your life. Even to reclaim the earth. The yeah. Anything that was stolen out of your life. And if a loved one dies and they want to be resurrected, there's no nothing stopping you from resurrecting them. Yeah. If there's somebody that you know that has, let's say the child died, then just go and declare them to hear your voice that they are healed and they will rise and resume their life. Yeah. Number 10 is the authority to break off all of Satan's yokes, chains, blankets, webs, vines, and roots, or any weapon designed to subdue and hinder a believer. They didn't have that in the first covenant. First as, uh, you know, it just wasn't there in the first testament. David had to suffer, see his son die and everything. Mm -hmm. Number 12 is the power and authority to cancel the effects of all toxins, to poisons, concoctions, and potions. And you see, some people will say over food, oh, I just love this food, or I just love that. They're turning it into a potion. You can break that power off. Because in this is also the power to break the soul ties. is the power and authority to forgive sins, to bless, uh, I should say to bless people, to bless the land, to bless homes, businesses, to be people that bless to speak blessings it says if you went to your home make sure you bless it before you before you step in and the, all the residents yeah. and if they if they're worthy of the blessing it'll stick with them if they're not it comes back and adds to your blessing so that sounds like it's a very dangerous thing to do, right? You might get overblessed. <laughs> I've received that. Yes. But you ought to go around issuing blessings. Yes, you do. Mm. See, even our cities are to be blessed. We're supposed to speak blessings over them and our country. 
in other countries, the leadership. Bless them. Bless them. The leadership. Constantly. Number 13 is the power and authority to baptize, to pray in the Holy Spirit, to bind and to loose. It's all part of that condition. The word baptism is to submerse. It doesn't mean just sprinkle water. Yeah. That's the worst out of water. Get wet. A desire not to be baptized means that there is a rebellion to the ninth covenant. If a person claims they know Yeshua and refuses to be baptized, they don't know Yeshua. They do not know the power that they have available to them in the Ninth Covenant. <clears throat> Mark 16, 16 says they believe and baptize, otherwise they're not saved. Mm -hmm. 14. The power and authority to declare and decree the will of our Father into and over all situations that come against us in life or against others in life or our communities as a whole. Fifteen is the power and authority to release angels for our defense, for debt cancellations, and to block all weapons of war against us that Satan can raise. All weapons. That includes viruses, germs, machine guns, arrows, poison darts, nuclear bombs, concussion bombs, <clears throat> so we have to ask it, are we properly releasing our angels to work are we using the word to release them to under the covenant do we recognize that is a covenant right under the ninth covenant you say release the angels to learn? Did you say learn? No, I never did. Okay. Um, 16 is the power to see both see and hear in the spirit. And we're empowered, we're given that grace to be able to see and hear in the spirit. When we act in fear and say, well, I'm not hearing it. You have been waiting on God to hear things, have you? And you haven't been declaring the word through mm -hmm. so that there's something for you to hear. If you're just stop speaking out your fears, you're not hearing anything. It's like one of those prayer wheels. You're just making a clanging noise. Doesn't say a thing to God. Uh, 17 is the power and authority to release the power and life of the blood of Yeshua and have it stand against all our enemies. And it's interesting that, because in all our enemies, it can mean that people that have turned themselves over to Satan, knowingly. Yeah. And Pastor Gerald, even like if we pray for those or those certain individuals, 
the individual that's being affected, they can't receive it because they're blocked yes. in Aries, aren't they? Yeah, they? yeah, yeah, they're often blocked. Eighteen is the power and authority to move mountains, calm the seas, and end Satan's power over storms, droughts, volcanoes by using faith in the declaration. We have the power to use our faith in this covenant. Nineteen. Oh, part of eighteen is that we have been given imagination so that we can um, see a God solution to the to an answer where the volcanoes need to be stopped, or where there's storms or droughts, or what caused it, what has to be done to get it corrected. Uh, Nineteen is the power and authority to enter our Father's throne room with boldness and with praise and worship. That's not given to everybody. That's given to those that are in that ninth covenant. You have to have blood to enter in. Number twenty. The power and authority to call forth miracles, to translate, to cause restoration to take place and to call down provisions stored up in heaven. Call them into being. If you come across, a, uh, let's say you're into an area and they have no food and haven't had food for days, but you have some sandwiches, well, you can bless them and they'll multiply and feed them whole area. Uh, 21 is the power and authority to carry the anointing in faith, hope, and compassionate love. So these 21 conditions to run and make up the foundation of the Ninth Covenant. If you reject any one of them, you're rejecting all of them. If you won't receive them, or won't accept them and won't receive them, you're rejecting all of them. Which explains why the church has not done them. Mm -hmm. You should have said, if you love me, you will obey me. And what was he referring to? The Ninth Covenant. Okay. This Ninth Covenant confirms that we belong to Yeshua and are sons of our Father. We have our identity confirmed in Yeshua through the Ninth Covenant. And we have eternal life confirmed in us through the Holy Spirit living in us and through us. So we pray that you consider the commitments into this Passover and the Ninth Covenant and use it as a base to grow and become more and more like Yeshua. In Yeshua's name we pray this. Amen. Amen. Amen.